Good morning. Good morning. The first Sunday of 2022. I hope you've all managed to avoid that rabbit hole called coronavirus and that you had a great Christmas with family. You know, we had a great Christmas with family. I do a Christmas with Linda's family. There was about 30 of us this year. A uh, big family, people coming from all around New Zealand. And it was just nice that actually nobody mentioned any kind of virus of any sort. Um, and we just enjoyed each other's company. And look, we've got Linda's parents with us, 90 and 93, you know. And the reality is, we won't have too many more Christmases with them. So it was just nice to do a, a kind of old-fashioned Christmas and just celebrate each other's company. So that was really good. So look, the first sermon of the year, and the kind of brief was, use your testimony and make it relevant. I thought, oh, okay. Right, right. Um, so the, the message, the title is, you are not who you think you are. Uh, and, that's, and that's kind of uh, the story of my life actually, and, and you'll, you'll, you'll get it as we go on. So look, it's quite common to make resolutions for the new year, right? And so I thought, oh, I'll just check some stats on that. Total waste of time, you know, total waste of time. Somewhere between 90 and like 95% of all New Year's resolutions fail to deliver any meaningful change whatsoever. So, okay, that's for New Year's resolutions. But in my mind, as Christians, the New Year is a good time to reflect on where we've been and where we're going. For us, as Christians, our journey is meant to be one of meaningful change. Note that word, meaningful. I don't mean change. We're all changing. If nothing else, we're all getting older. But we are changing. But for us... If we bring that first scripture up, it's all about meaningful change. And there are so many scriptures about that. Um, in fact, I had to cut them down. <laughs> you know, therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, amen, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. You know, it is meant to be a journey of change that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of God, which is confusing, are being transformed into the same image of that glory of God, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. You know, for us, it's not New Year's resolutions, but it is a good time to reflect on that change. And the change is happening. It's just, well, what change is happening and to what degree and where? So I thought, right, the issue is not change. We're all changing. But are we are who we think we are? So for me, by the total and absolutely undeserved grace of God... He's taught me time and time again, I am not who I thought I was. So when I was really young, like really young, I'm talking like 11 or 12, I thought I was this mini kind of gangster dude. <laughs> right? A right little crim. <laughs> you know, a little hoodlum. <laughs> and so me and my mate, We's doing these little criminal behaviours, you know? We're out there stealing cars. We're, we're breaking into shops. We're being right little SHITs, right? And this all ended <laughs> in the youth court. We used to have a youth court back then. We still do, but it's a different sort now. Takapuna, North Shore. And the judge is looking down at me, and I'm just bewildered by all this, and, and Dad's paid for a lawyer, and he's making this argument about why I should not be removed from my home environment. And I thought, where do you think I'm going? <laughs> no, no, they were talking about sending me off to a borstal. 
I thought, my God, that's not me. <laughs> that was just a bit of stupidity. That was not me. Luckily, they did not send me off to a ball still. But my parents sent me off to a Marist boarding school. Well, okay, let's not call it a borstal. <laughs> but it was a Maris boarding school. Um, and basically their idea was to keep me out of trouble. Didn't work. Uh, but luckily, I'm in Whangarei, in this Maris boarding school. They're in Auckland. So they didn't really know all the trouble I was getting into. And my motto was, if you didn't get caught, you got away with it. Uh, and so I got away with a lot. But one of the things I learnt there is it was a Catholic Marist Brothers boarding school, and it did introduce me not so much to God, but to Christianity and the principles of the Bible. Now, that was a good foundation laid in my life. I uh, didn't particularly appreciate it at the time, but it was a good foundation laid. But what disillusioned me with all that was the great difference between what people say and what people do. You know, that really kind of, I guess, made me particularly cynical. And so I thought, right, Christianity, oh, they're those people that talk a lot, but their life doesn't match their words. And so I was pretty cynical about all that. And believe it or not, I wasn't particularly shy in my opinions on all that, you know? So I thought, right, well, there is a God, I just don't know where. So I leave school, do a whole lot of things, um, end up working in construction. Well, let's see if we have that first photo. At this stage, I'm working in construction. By this time, I'm imagining myself as a young, tough, fit construction worker, you know, living in King's Cross, earning a lot of money, and spending a lot of money on what we would call the pleasures of the world. Uh, money's coming in and money's going straight out. And I looked around at the guys I'm working with on this construction site, and they were all leading the same life, thank you, as me. And you would have to say, utterly superficial. Totally meaningless, utterly superficial. And what worried me is that I looked at guys who are a good 10 plus years older than me, and I thought, oh, this could be me if I stayed here. But this ain't me. So, next photo. I'm waste. oh, that's, that's the very end. <laughs> They're now out of order. Um, go to the next photo after that. Oh, okay, that's the very end. We're now at the very end. They're completely out of sequence. Gee, that'll be interesting. I want the one of the guy and he's passing me a joint. <laughs> this is a good mate of mine, Mark. No, but we're in a park and, and this is kind of like my life at that stage. Pretty self-indulgent. Have a joint? Yeah, no worries. Uh, spending a lot of money on a lot of trivial stuff. But at the time, even then I realised, actually, that's not me. You know, that actually was just a waste of time. It was a waste of a huge amount of money. I could have bought a house for all this money I'm wasting, but I was earning a lot of money. And, of course, you know, when you're young and dumb, you think these good days continue. Well, no, they don't. What's the next photo? This will be a mystery now. Okay, that's, now we're back into sequence. I knew being a construction worker, smoking an awful lot of dope, drinking an awful lot of alcohol was not me. It took me most of a year to work that out, but after a year I was sick of it actually. It was just time-wasting nonsense. I'm just getting older and I'm going nowhere. So I thought, right, let's, let's radically turn this around. Let's go to Africa. If God was anywhere, I reckon you could find him in Africa. So, <laughs> I went to Africa. That there is the very top of Table Mountain in Cape Town. Um, now, it wasn't by random chance that I'm in South Africa. My sister had married a South African, 
and I'd caught up with them and I wanted to take a year off and, and look for more meaning in life. So I thought, look, Africa's as good as place as any. Uh, I was thoroughly disillusioned of the Western lifestyle because it was utterly trivial, superficial, totally consumerist, nothing really of value, uh, completely disillusioned me. So I'm in Africa and I'm having a wander around. And don't forget, right, my view of spirituality is that it's a reflection of the life that you lead. What's the next photo? No, the, the one guy in orange, just the guy in orange alone, him. I'm now in Malawi, <laughs> backpacking around Africa, and I meet this guy. And I thought, whoa, hello, <laughs> g'day. <laughs> and we start chatting. And um, I'm interested. I've never met a man like that. And I, you know, what do you believe in? And, and what are you about? And uh, he belonged to an organization called Ananda Marga. Now, there's this enormous family of religions called Hinduism, which is thousands of variations of a central theme. And even those thousands of variations go off into an infinite variety of little cul-de-sacs. <laughs> and, and way down one of those offshoots of an offshoot of an offshoot is this organization called Ananda Marga. And I thought, wow, what are you about? Well, he's a Hindu. I thought, oh, I didn't even know what a Hindu was. What do you believe in? Oh, about uh, spirituality and about self-development and about becoming a good person and about doing good things and all these things. And I thought, oh, that kind of resonates. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, you know. Um, tell me more. And he told me more. And then he said, do you want to, do you want to join? <laughs> oh, hold on. Do I want to join? What, what would that mean? He said, oh, that's quite simple. You would give away all worldly possessions. You would renounce all of your relationships with everyone you know on this earth and come and join us. Sounds reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, yeah, I'm in. I'm in. Next photo. And so I joined this organization. I'm now a Hindu monk. Well, it beats being a construction worker in Sydney. I'm a vegetarian. I am getting up at like four o'clock in the morning, having a shower, which was a bucket of water on some concrete steps at the back of this little thing. A bucket of uh, the cup in the bucket of cold water. That's your shower. Get up, and then you're doing meditating, and then we're eating vegetarian meals, and by 6 o'clock in the morning, we're out ready doing all sorts of things. What's the next photo? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of social activities they were doing, a lot of health clinics, a lot of schools, a lot of education, all sorts of things. Next photo. Then we get to, uh, in 87, in Natal, in South Africa, they had very bad flooding, really bad flooding. Like, the skies opened and it poured for a couple of weeks. And so Ananda Marga did disaster relief. I thought that was like the UN or somebody. They said, oh, no, 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 look, that's, that's, they, they have no money and they just achieved amazing things. So we partnered with an organisation that had money. So we said, well, we need a helicopter. They said, sure, what are we doing? He said, we're going around this area, next photo, and we're having a look to see how bad the damage is. Next photo. And we had a look, and the damage was pretty bad. Next photo. And so the houses had dissolved. The good, I mean, mud huts are very echo in this day and age. I mean, you know, come on. Echo friendly to the max. You know, completely natural resources go into these huts. But they're mud. When it rains hard, they just melt. So we weren't so concerned with the huts because the local people know how to rebuild those huts. They don't need any input from us but the food. Next one. So we thought, right, we need food. So we went to this organisation and said, listen, we need food. How much? Oh, look, initial estimate, 25 tonne. No problem. Hmm, OK, thank you. Next one. So we get this food. We borrow the trucks. We get it out. We're going into these villages, into in the New Zealand context of a marae, but they're just like a community centre of the different villages. We're getting all these food, next photo, and we start distributing. You just go to whoever's got a truck in that area, we said, can we borrow your truck? He couldn't really say no <laughs> because we were distributing food, and he would be an unpopular chap to say no. 
So he said yes. Uh, we'd borrow any kind of truck, it didn't matter what it was, whatever, just a truck, we'd load it up and then we'd go around the villages distributing food. Well, of course, the people loved us. We we're giving out like 20 kilo bags of maize. Maize meal is, uh, it's not rice, um, but it's, it's kind of, a, it's made from maize and, and it's their staple. They can put anything or nothing with it and they can live for an indefinite period of time depending on what they had to put with it. So that's a core staple food. Next one. We're distributing all this. For me, good works, right? I'm, I'm living the values. Spirituality should not be what you say, it should be what you do. And I'm doing good works. Next photo. At the end of that year, I had to make a decision. I had a round-the-world air ticket, and I was either going to take the last leg of that flight or the next leg of that flight or stay in Africa. So the question was, yet again, is this who I really was? And I hummed and I hard and I hard and I hummed, and the bottom line is I just knew it actually wasn't me. That in, in deep down, as good as those things were, and there's a million other stories I haven't told you, some of them were just amazing, but was it of real significance? Uh, not for me. Not disparaging those people doing good works, but not for me. It wasn't for me. So now I'm in Amsterdam, thoroughly disillusioned with life. Thought I had been doing something of value, of meaning, of worth. Nah. <laughs> nah. There's the short answer. She's my cousin. She's shown me around Holland. You know, I've got lots of rallies in Holland. She's shown me around. Next photo. Then I end up in London, because I'm ticky touring around. And of all the places to meet God, it just blew me away that you would meet God in St. Paul's Cathedral. That would be the last place on earth that I think you would meet God. I mean, it's a beautiful building. You know, it is a spectacular building. And built to the glory of God. That's a wonderful thing too. But as for meeting God... Like, that God, Big Huey. No, no I, didn't, I didn't think that would happen. So I'm in St. Paul's, and I'm reflecting on my life, thinking, hasn't worked out really how I kind of thought it might. And there was a little chapel off one side which said, keep out. So I thought, well, that's perfect. I'll go in there, because <laughs> no one else would go in there. And so I did. Shut the door. The door was like at least 12 inches thick, this enormous timber door. So swing it shut, little wee side chapel. Lord knows how thick the walls were, but you couldn't hear a thing. And it was perfectly quiet. No one there. Keep out on the sign on the door. I thought, well, then I'm not going to be interrupted. So I thought, well, I'll just stop and reflect on where I'd been and where I'm going. Didn't know where I was going, to be honest. And it was just... A, a remarkable experience for me as a very non-Christian person to feel that God himself was in that room with me encouraging me to keep searching. I thought, well, signposts? <laughs> Direction? No, 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 just keep searching. So I thought, wow, okay. So the short version is, after going around the mountain a few more times, I end up back in... New Zealand, and good friends of mine had become Christians. Now, these were hard-drinking people. He was in the Navy, and, sh and she eventually married him. She had her first child by 16, first husband by 18, second child by 18, uh, then married Jamie, then had a few more kids, and really hard-drinking people. And on my scale, if you could knock off a bottle of whiskey, rum, Bacardi in a night... That's pretty hard drinking, and they'd have no difficulty with that. And I thought, wow, they became Christians. I thought, oh, my God, they're nutters. But I couldn't reconcile the difference. The difference just had no words. The lifestyle that I knew they had led to where they were now, and most remarkably, totally non-judgmental. So that photo a few, a few back, where that guy's handing me a joint, Mark was a good mate of mine, he became a Christian. What a nut job. 
he decided that as a born-again Christian, everyone like me was a total sinner directly on the highway to hell unless he could convince me to get off it. Well, that didn't work. (laughs) No one's going to argue me into the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Wasn't going to happen. But these guys, Vicky and Jamie, they didn't have to say anything. I just couldn't reconcile the change. And so, long story short, I'm in a church, a New Life Church, and it was the funniest thing. Uh, They're doing an altar call. And I thought, oh, you know, I can only sit on the fence for so long. And so I watched myself get out of my seat and go down the front. And I'm looking at myself down the front there thinking, I should probably go join myself (laughs) and um, do this whole salvation thing. And I did. Um, The New Life pastor, John Tiplady, uh, was a very well-known New Life pastor. I actually cut him off because I knew the words. Uh, I didn't need him to lead me in the sinner's prayer of repentance. I knew where I'd been. I knew what I'd done. And I knew that I had to change. And so that was a, that was a transformational journey to get to there. But of course, that, like all of us, is like, first base. It's not really about first base. You do need to get to first base, but of course it's all about this transformational change, right? As Christians, it's not so much about what we say, it's about what we do, all right? And so, of course, like all of us, you know, the Christian life has its highs and it has its lows, and that's the struggle. And of course, it's not so much people per se speaking into our lives, the impact for most of us is people very close to us. When they speak into our lives, it's either positive or it's either negative, you know, and it's overcoming the negative. So just this week, my darling youngest daughter, who's about to turn 17, reminded me of how unchristian I was because I had been divorced. You know, yes, darling, you know, she's a Catholic and I thought, no, I won't show you scriptures about (laughs) what it is to be saved, but she's just full of the sharp barb when she wants to shut you down. And of course, it's only those people that are close to you, really, that have the impact. You know, people at work, you can brush them off, you know. Friends, they're either close or distant. You can brush them off. It's the people close to you who have the impact. And it's like, wow. And so, as I reflect on last year and what I want out of this year, the bottom line is I want that process of transformation or change. So what's the biggest impediment to that? Well, actually thinking about that over the last few days, that would really be the lies that I tell myself. That would be the biggest impediment. I would be carrying the baggage that would be the biggest hindrance to me having the life I want out of next year. So, the question is, what deceitful bag of lies will you continue (laughs) to carry into 2022? Well, I don't have a lot of time, so I've just got to give you the headlines. <laughs> Let me give you some examples that you are not worthy. You know? Gee, if, if, if Satan can get you to carry that one, oh, man, you're walking in chains. You are walking in chains. You know? Of course, Satan, the father of lies, he's rather good at his job. That you are not truly loved by your father in heaven. Gee, now that's just a variation on the first one, you know? That your past prevents deep intimacy with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you know? That's not a black and white one. That's to what degree does your past convince you that you can't have that deep intimacy with the Holy Spirit? And we all have a past, whether it's as colourful as mine or not. That doesn't really matter. We all have a past, and the only thing that matters is really what we believe of it. Is it holding us back, or is it part of my journey into Christ's likeness? <laughs> Another one. 
don't forget, I'm talking about deceitful bags of lies. That your best days are past. You know, uh, that's an intergenerational message. Do you know that that can apply to young people as well as older people? That young people can say, oh, you know, when I was young, I was in youth groups and I was doing this. And oh, man, we were, do- we were just preaching here, there and everywhere. It can apply to young people as well as older people. It doesn't matter. A lie is a lie. God, Satan just wants you to believe it. It doesn't matter where in your life he can get you to believe it. If he can get you to believe it, you're just filling up the bag. The opinions of friends and family are true, of value, and are motivated to build you up. You know, now let's be generous and say sometimes that is true. But let's be honest and say often that's not actually true. They're speaking out of their own life experience, their own hurts, their own understandings. And if they're non-Christians, they're simply speaking out of the world. You know, when I decided to become a lawyer, everyone I knew just laughed. I just... (laughs) (laughs) They couldn't believe it. I said, hold on, you've done a million jobs, but nothing particularly academic. (laughs) When I went to the law school, they laughed. And they just said, oh, it's not happening. And I said, oh, what have I got to do? And I said, well, go and do some academic study. I said, oh. Not a, and they wouldn't allow me to do it at a university. They sent me off to a, um, a polytechnic. I did legal executive papers for a year. And then after that year, I came back and said, right, are we, are we finished with your little fantasies? Can I start my law? <laughs> they said, hell no. <laughs> That's only a polytechnic. I said, yes, but you told me to do it. So I, that was only to see if you could do university study. I said, oh, what do I got to do now? They said, oh, you've got to do a year of arts. Really? Like a year? Another year? They said, yes. So I did another year of arts. That went well. Then I went back to them another time and said, are we finished with this little fantasy that I can't do law? They said, oh, we really don't think you can, but, but you can do first year law, thinking the failure rate of that's about 75, 80%. And they were quite confident that first year law would just knock me out and I'd be over this and I'd go and work in a factory again. Well, Stupid them. I decided to become a lawyer. (laughs) I kept telling them this, but they didn't believe me. And eventually did the law degree, this, that, and the other. But it meant that pretty well, apart from my family, everyone else in my life, I had to drop off. They were just fixed with a picture of me that was of my past. I had realised that was not me. I had realised that I'm going to create a new future for myself. And there were a lot of people that just didn't hang out anymore. Like, it was a season, been there, done that, time to move on. Back to our deceitful bag of lies. Another one, that the approval of others will make you happy. You know, gee, that one is a, that one is a deep, deep, dark hole. You know, and you can be motivated to do good things for good reasons. But that can become a trap, you know. Um, You know, when I think of my first marriage was for 20 years and I thought it would be the good thing as a Christian man to work hard to provide for your family. That would be a good thing to do, to be a good, solid, faithful, hard-working husband. I thought that would be a good thing to do. Well, it was but in balance. And when that becomes out of balance and you don't keep everything else alive and functioning as it should, a relationship, a marriage, all that hard work got me divorced. So when my daughter throws it at me, (laughs) that cuts a bit deep. But then I think, hold on, I've got to think about today's message. How many lies do you want to hang on to? I can hang on to an awful lot, you know. I bet we all could, really. But of course, nah. When I think of those those first three songs, man, that's my testimony in songs. You know, new wine. You know, the mystery of God, you're so good. You know, totally undeserved. The last couple of lies that I wrote down here. That you are doing the will of God. Well, hold on. We're all meant to be doing the will of God. 
we are doing the will of God. Well, actually, um, we are doing the will of God. Now, that's a, that would be a constant reassessment that we are doing the will of God. Actually, sometimes we started off doing the will of God and we created a little empire for ourselves. God's saying there's a new season. God's saying, I have a new thing for you. You know, sometimes we deceive ourselves as Christians because it's nice and comfortable out there in Christianity, sitting on our backsides, thinking, I know what I'm doing, I know who I am, and I'm in the will of God. That could be true, but it could also be used as an excuse not to do the will of God. Um, To be blunt, and I quite like blunt, You know, I've seen a lot of Christians over the last uh, more than 20 years. Gee, you know, that's a common excuse. I'm sitting here doing the will of God. No, you're not. You're lying. You're absolutely lying. Not everybody. But then for me, I think, right, 2022, what do I need to be doing to be in the will of God, right? Where should I be in my relationship with God? It's a constant battle to put down the lies that people have spoken over to me, or more importantly, that I've spoken over myself, right? Those are the lies that have the biggest impact that I need to put down. For 2022, it is a good time to reflect on last year, We know that 2022 is going to be massively uncertain. Don't believe anybody who's predicting 2022. We don't know what it's going to be like. So then what's my response to that? I want more intimacy with God. You know, if the one thing that I want to hold on to for 2022, amongst the uncertainty and the barbs of the enemy coming in and of all sorts of people is the intimacy with God. I want more of that for 2022. I read out a scripture before, and I'm going to read uh, the New Living Translation. There's a much better translation. So all of us who have had that veil removed, amen, and can see and reflect the glory of the Lord, and the Lord who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. 2 Corinthians 3.18. That's my scripture for the beginning of this year. You know, I want to continue the journey. I'm going to let go of the past and the highs and the lows. In this time of uncertainty, I want more of God. I want you to reflect on 2022. Don't make it a New Year's resolution, but it will be uncertain. The the things that you value will be the things that you do. Your actions will speak louder than words. If you want more intimacy with God, then what would change to bring about more intimacy with God? So that's my heart and prayer for this message, that we choose God in the times of uncertainty and a million opinions over a million things, including COVID, that amongst all that noise, it's just noise, we would hold on to that intimacy with God. Amen. Thank you, guys.